Welcome to the third lecture in the Spring Law, Politics, and Media uh, lecture series. My name is Keith Bybee, and I direct the Institute for the Study of Judiciary, Politics, and Media. Uh, uh, this lecture series is part of a Law, Politics, and Media course that's co-taught by um, Lisa Dolak, uh, Roy Gutterman, uh, and myself. And this lecture series is co-sponsored by IJPM and the Tully Free Speech Center, which is directed by Roy Mad Dog Gutterman right there. Uh, the aim of this speaker series is to bring in uh, practitioners from the fields of law, politics, and media to address uh, issues at the intersection of those three topics. And uh, today we're fortunate enough to have uh, someone from the world of law and policy making. Michael Arcuri is a former member of the U.S. House of Representatives from New York State's 24th District. Uh, Michael Arcuri served for two terms in Congress and was a member of the uh, Powerful Rules Committee. Uh, prior to serving in Congress, uh, he worked as the United County District Attorney uh, where he established the county's first drug courts, uh, launched the Oneida County Drug Task Force, and created the Oneida County Child Advocacy Center. He is currently of counsel at Hancock and uh, Estabrook, Hancock and Estabrook, which is a, a firm here in Syracuse, where he works in government relations, corporate law, white collar crime, and litigation. Uh, he earned his BA at the University of Albany and his JD from New York Law School. Uh, he is an active uh, commentator, still in politics, and he contributed to the political blog, The Arena, and uh, has been a prominent member of the uh, Democratic Party and a self-identified Blue Dog Democrat. Let me tell us what that means and why it's uh, a label that he wears proudly. Um, he will uh, speak today for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity for question and answer. And at 5 o'clock, there'll be a reception right here in this room, which will be a continued opportunity uh, for discussion. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Michael Arcuri. Thank you very much. It really is a pleasure and an honor to be here. You know, many of you will see someday when you become lawyers, it doesn't matter where you go, where you speak, there is no honor like being asked to speak at a, at a law school once you're an attorney. And it's... Uh, it's a great privilege, so thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. <clears throat> turning and turning the widening gyre, the best lack all convictions, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Things fall apart, and the center cannot hold. Now, that is a, a quote. Um, I mixed it around just a little bit, but it's an exact quote from an excerpt of The Second Coming by William Yates in 1919. And Yates, I think, was writing uh, most likely about World War I uh, and battle. But I think it has uh, a very similar uh, tie-in to politics as well. Uh, in politics, like military battles, when the middle breaks, uh, the center can no longer hold. You have a breakdown of order. You have chaos, and you have real difficulty in terms of, um, well, in the battlefield, obviously, maintaining your your, your, your battle line and your composure in winning the battle. And I think very much from a political perspective, um, while it's a bit overstated, I think um, when the middle breaks or the middle begins to break, the function of our democratic republic becomes much more difficult for us to hold together. You know, today here in America, we seem to be wedged um, really between um, alternate poles, if you will, the, well, the, whether it's conservative, liberal, right, left, um, every issue seems to polarize us. Think about it. Abortion, taxes, uh, entitlements, war, gay marriage. You name the issue and chances are there's passionate partisans on both sides of the issue. Uh, and it's finding suitable compromise um, that I think is very difficult. And what, but what we need to do more and more of and what there's less and less of. I'd submit that um, when, for instance, how do you find compromise? What is compromise? What is a moderate? What do you do? Is there compromise on every issue? Not always, but, but think about, is there compromise on, on gay marriage? Could we find a compromise? Probably not. But think about this. There was a compromise at one point with respect to allowing gays in the military. And what was that? 
Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We look back now at Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And, and I was one of the sponsors of the, my, my good friend Patrick Murphy was actually the prime sponsor of the bill that allowed um, gays into the military. Um, I was one of the sponsors on that. I'm really proud to be a part of that. But you think we look back now on Don't Ask, Don't Tell and think how silly that was. But really, but for that incremental step, we may not have been able to get to the point that we're at now. So I'd submit that that's one of the places that when you look for compromise, you're able to find it. Now, I want to say this. You know, this afternoon we, we had a luncheon, and, and I, I had prepared remarks. But this afternoon, we just sort of talked about things, and it really flowed much better. So as we're going along, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand, ask it. it I think it'll make our, our discussion move much better. A little bit from, I think, a, a historical perspective, we're a nation filled with compromises. I mean, George Washington was the first great compromise. I mean, think about what he had to, who he had to moderate. He had, he had the likes of Thomas Jefferson and Madison on one side and John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. I mean, think about Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. Could you get two more opposite polarizing figures? And yet Washington was able through um, moderation, through good sense and probably his own very strong personal appeal to be able to balance that. But he was able to balance it and sort of keep the opposing poles whether it was the rural urban fight, whether it was uh, the industrial versus the agricultural, or ultimately the north-south sort of um, forces at bay. And these things just kept brewing though. And many people will say because we kept compromising, because of the Henry Clays of the world, because the moderates kept compromising, we ended up with the Civil War. We ended up with a situation that was untenable. But we can't mistake moderation for kicking the can down the road, which is ultimately what happens very often. And we're seeing that a lot in politics now. I mean, what happens? Um, you can't come to a decision. You can't make the hard choices. So what do they end up doing? They kick the can down the road. Well, let's, let's move it down. We're seeing that even now with sequester, right? That issue is coming up and we're talking about, well, let's put it off now for a little while longer so we can see if we could find some other uh, more tenable solutions. So don't mistake being um, what the author Gil Troy in the book calls a muscular moderate with real leadership. Being a moderate does not mean lack of leadership. It means finding solutions and then having the ability to push those solutions through. Um, unfortunately, I think many believe that moderate's not about the tough decisions, but rather finding a path of least resistance, which is clearly uh, not the case. Um, I, I think that... Um, Moderate leadership um, is not a leader who lacks conviction, but rather who finds the politically possible and the morally acceptable solutions and has the wisdom and ability to bring those solutions, uh, to make those a reality. Um, since moderates are those seeking moderate positions tend to be less impassioned about issues, think about this. Who do you find in today's world to be the most passionate when it comes to issues? Is it the people in the middle, the people who understand? It's generally the people at the extreme poles. We see conservatives being very passionate about their issues. We see liberals being very passionate about their issues. And the people in the middle, the, the people that are willing to compromise, tend to be those that, that um, uh, don't have a strong position. And, and I find this came up this afternoon, and I think it's a great point. Most people consider themselves moderates. I mean, think about it. How many people in this room consider themselves a moderate? Um, I have to tell a, you could raise your hand, I'd love to see it if you mm -hmm. consider yourself a moderate, if not, I, mean, I think many people do. Interesting story. So I was in my law firm, uh, I, was, I was talking with one of the senior partners, one of the very senior partners, and they said, what do you have going on? And I said, uh, next week I have to go up to the law school and speak about um, the title of my, my, my talk is The Extinction of the American Moderate. And they said, that's not true, that's not the case. So while I couldn't say, you know, while I couldn't get feisty with them on a legal issue, on politics I, I can. And I said, what are you, of course there is. What are you kidding me? And they said, no, that, that's not the case. I said, yes, it is. They said, well, I'm a moderate. And I said, I looked at are you kidding me? You are the least moderate person that I know. You are the most conservative person in this entire law. The conservatives in the law firm say you're conservative. So how can you say, well, you know, look at my position with respect to A, B, and C. Actually, it was just A. 
And I said, um, yeah, but that, does, that still doesn't make you moderate. And then therein, I think, is a big problem with, moderate, with, with people who are moderate. Everyone thinks they're a moderate. Um, uh, oh, I'm a moderate, except for this and this and this and this and this issue. Um, so I, I think that is one of the things um, that creates um, a problem for moderates. But, you know, whether it's a push from the right, you know, and, and Lincoln, I, I'm not sure whether, uh, where we would have considered Lincoln as on the left or on the right, but in any case, we know Lincoln was pushed very hard by the Thaddeus Stevens faction to immediately abolish slavery. Um, and he took a more, mus what we call a muscular, moderate approach to do it in, in, in a way that he, I mean, and again, I guess his, his primary concern was if he, did, if he freed the slaves too quickly, we would have lost the border states before we were able to secure them. So he took a different sort of tag. Roosevelt did the same thing, our next great crisis. Roosevelt was pushed hard by the left. Shows, you know, he didn't nationalize the banks when many liberals wanted the banks nationalized. He cut salaries for federal employees, which many people told him not to do, but he felt was something he had to do. So, you know, and you see that with great leaders. Reagan did it all the time. They talk tough, and then they move to the, the middle. You see President Obama doing it all the time. He talks, you know, he, he says the things that his base want to hear, and then he moves to the middle. He moves to the place where he could try to build consensus. And that's what moderates, that's what good, strong moderates do. <clears throat> now, I, I guess really the, the better point, and I've called my, my, my discussion the extinction of the American moderate, but I think probably the better topic would be hibernation of the American moderate, because we all know from history that really moderate, uh, history is cyclical, especially in America. And we see times when we go one way and we think we're never going to. I remember just before I ran for office, I think it was in 2004, 2005. And I can remember listening to one of the national commentators saying, after this most recent apportionment, the Democrats will never get the House of Representatives back after what the Republicans were able to do in the state of Texas. Sure enough, a couple of years later in 2006, the Democrats were able to do that. So, you know, you recognize it's, things are, are very cyclical in that regard. Um, and to that point, so in 2006, I, I ran, I was elected in 2006. Rahm Emanuel was the chairman of the uh, Democratic Campaign Committee, what we call DAC. And, and Rahm's idea was to get moderate centrist Democrats. That is, Democrats who looked almost as much as Republican, almost as much like Republicans as they did Democrats run them in moderate districts, in districts that had potential, swing, what we call swing districts, and try to win the House of Representatives back this way. That was what Ron did, and, and he was very successful in doing it. So he was able to find the middle, and the Democrats, as a result of that, were able to build a, a large moderate base, and they were able to expand on that after President Obama was elected, with a lot of us that were what we call blue dog Democrats, and, and that is conservative to moderate Democrats. Um, which, interestingly enough, I was one of them. It tends to be a Southern group. Um, I was one of the token New York, one of the few token New Yorkers that was a, a, a blue dog. But we staked out the middle and moved to the left, which is generally what a moderate will do. Well, it was interesting because everyone, that was the formula that had been the formula for a while with each side. I mean, generally in the House of Representatives, you have about 150 to 175 safe Democratic districts. You have about 150 to 175 safe Republican districts. That leaves about 100, thereabouts, goes back and forth districts that are really in play, and those are the ones you fight over. Well, in 2010, the, the Republicans were able to totally change the formula, and they, they ran a few moderates. Uh, for instance, in my district, they ran a moderate against me, uh, and he was successful. But in many of the districts, they ran Tea Party conservative Republicans, and they were able to take the districts. So you saw a different formula, and, but they were very successful with it. And we're going to talk a little bit in just a couple minutes about why that change along with the, uh, the reapportionment in the 2012, I think, have made it that much more difficult for, for moderates um, in the future. But let's talk about why it's difficult today to be a moderate. Let's talk about some of the reasons. Let's talk first about the media. Uh, and, and the media is clearly one of the reasons 
why I think it's difficult um, to be a moderate. And the media does not always create a favorable environment for moderates. Why do you think that is? Anybody? Why do you think it's difficult? Why, why wouldn't? Yes. Absolutely. It just doesn't make for good TV. I mean, really, what would you, who would you rather see debating? Would you rather see two moderate centrists who have similar opinions in our region, or would you rather see an Alan West and an Alan Grayson, two Florida extreme um, uh, polarizing figures, you know, uh, locking horns uh, in, um, uh, in, in a debate? So it really, and I don't blame, I, I honestly don't blame the media. The media does exactly what the market calls on them to do. I mean, how many people want to watch dull TV? I think in, in the reading, uh, you may have seen that they said during the Johnson administration that they were plagued by the fact that people, they were finally getting to understand the fact that people preferred watching protesters on the news than reasonable leaders uh, talking about issues that they could resolve together. So the media plays to these viewpoints. You know, I, I think about a time I was asked once and only once to be on a hardball with Chris Matthews. And I was asked, to, and, and it was interesting because they didn't call and ask first um, what my position on a particular issue was. They just assumed because I was a blue dog Democrat that I would be very conservative and I would be, but, but I'm an upstate New York Democrat, which is a lot different than generally um, what some of the conservative Southern Democrats are like. So. They, they asked me to be on the show along with a very um, a liberal Philadelphia Democrat. And we started discussing it, and it's very difficult because I was up here on a screen, and I'm having a debate with someone who I can't see, and I'm looking at a, at a, at a plain wall, and it's very hard to, to have a debate. But the fact of the matter was we agreed on almost everything. And um, Chris Matthews was furious at me for not being where he thought I would be, and, and he ended up really kind of having a debate with me because I wasn't where he thought I should be on the issue. Um, so I never, needless to say, I was never asked to be on the Chris Matthews show again. Um, so it just doesn't, um, it, it isn't what I think is um, what the media wants there. And, and it isn't the media. The media responds to what you and I and, and the general public want to see. So again, I don't slight them for it, but I think that that clearly is one of the problems today. And so you get um, elected officials who want to get out there and say what they have to say to get on TV. All right? And there's a couple of reasons for that, and we'll talk about that. Um, but I think about this story. Um, there, well, there, there's a second reason. So let's talk about the second reason. Second reason is fundraising. Okay? Fundraising is, I think, a real issue in terms of why it's difficult to be a moderate. A couple of reasons. Um, one is, today it takes just extraordinary amounts of money to get elected. Let me give you a for instance. So I represented the old 24th district, which was U primarily Utica. When actually, it went all the way around Syracuse. I was east of Syracuse, south of Syracuse, and west of Syracuse. I went up to Geneva right on the thruway. So I had the area all around Syracuse. Um, very relatively rural district, um, pretty large district, larger than a couple of, larger than Rhode Island and Connecticut, uh, so it was pretty good size. Uh, but in any case, I spent to get elected the first time $2 million. My opponent spent $2 million, and the campaign committees probably at least, at the very least, spent a million dollars each. So think about that. That race cost between five and six million dollars for what it was is, is pretty much a pretty poor um, district. So that means in order to get elected, you have to raise large amounts of money. Now, that was then. That was really before super PACs. You know, the first time I ran, super PACs were not really, had not really come into their own. In just that short time between 2006 and today, we have super PACs. Now, if a super PAC targets you, you have real problems because they're going to pump not only the amount of money that your opponent spends, but the amount of money that the PAC spends against you as well. So it's going to be huge amounts of money. So that requires people to raise large amounts of money. So why is that difficult then for moderates? Two reasons. First one is it's easy to raise money on the polls, on the fringes, because if you're a liberal and you, you, know, you, you talk about the liberal issues, 
the liberals will contribute. You, on the conservative side, again, the same thing, the conservatives. If you're in the middle, you tend to, you tend to make the liberals mad when you don't support a bill that they want. The conservatives are never going to like you if you don't support their bill. So, you know, you, you draw, but you don't draw from, you don't get that strong support. That's the first thing. The second thing is that when you go on a television show and you get up there and you say something outlandish about the other side, those Democrats are this, you know, the, the, I guarantee you're, you're, that evening you'll have enormous amounts of contributions from all because now we have a national media and it happens. Um, and same thing with the Republicans. I mean, people, the Michelle Bachmans of the world, the Alan Graysons of the world, the Alan West, they raise huge amounts of money when they get up there and go on these shows. And I'll give you a specific example. Do you remember, how many people remember Joe Wilson? Remember Joe Wilson, the South Carolina congressman? Um, Joe Wilson uh, made a comment during one of President Obama's speeches to the House of Representatives. I think it was one of the State of the Unions. And he, he yelled out, Still a question whether he said, you're a liar or that's a lie. Um, I don't know that we'll ever resolve that. But in any case, he apologized. The president accepted the apology. Nonetheless, then he, start, then he went back to his office and he saw what started happening. In, in any case, he raised thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars because of that. I mean, just an incredible, an obscene amount of money came in and he didn't even have to do anything other than the fact that he was embroiled in this controversy because he said that something that the president said was a lie. So it sort of shows you that the fundraising from the, the extreme polls is much easier than when you're a moderate. So people tend to not want to be the moderate because it's too hard to fundraise. And if you're not fundraising today, forget about it. That's a whole other lecture we could do about the need and the importance of of, of finding campaign finance reform, but suffice it to say, it creates a real problem, I think, for moderates because it really, um, it, it's, I think it's most difficult for moderates to fundraise um, as opposed to, to either side of, of, the, of the spectrum. Now, one of the other things that um, I think is, is important, and one of the things that you see today is that and this is going to sound a little bit strange when I say it, but one of the problems, one of the difficulties in finding solutions today is there's not a lot of money left for discretionary spending. Okay, now think about that for a minute. So if you have an individual who might be wavering on an issue, okay, but he, she knows that if she votes for that issue, that she, she, she likes, but she is going to get extraordinary heat back home for voting on that issue. She's hesitant on doing it because of the politics of it. She likes it, but the politics. So in, in, in the negotiating that goes on, um, it, there's, there's some kind of understanding, not a quid pro quo, but there's an understanding that you know, she needs a bridge back in her district. And maybe if she gets that bridge, which is a really important thing for her district, maybe that will sort of um, ease some of the um, um, uh, discontent over not supporting that bill or for supporting that bill. So you might be able to help to work negotiation, help to work deals when there's, when there's no money flowing, when there's, when there's very little money that can be used for discretionary spending, there's very little that can be done in terms of helping to, to, to create these. And you know, you're not going to hear that from a sitting car. I don't know that I would have said that five years ago when I was in the House, but, but it clearly is, when you think about it, it's logical. It's, 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 it's much more difficult now because there are no earmarks. You know, there, there are no, um, uh, th there's no, there's very little discretionary spending left on the part of the federal government. So what you're ending up seeing is, so how do people get notary, no, notoriety back home? All right. If they can't bring in, and you know, for, for years they brought an earmark, they'd have a new road put in, they'd have a bridge fixed, they'd bring money back. To the, if they can't do that anymore, how do they do it? It's rhetoric. How do you get the people back home to recognize you? You have to say things. So you go on the national media and you say things. And how do you get on the national media? By saying sometimes some of these outlandish things. So some of those things are the reasons I think that, that you're seeing um, um, less and less influence by the moderates and more and more influence um, on the extremes. So let's talk a little bit, enough of, of, of past, let's talk a little bit about politics today. Um, let's talk about why it's so difficult 
what happens to moderates. So now in 2012, um, actually stepping back a couple of years, the Republicans, I just read a good article recently, the Republicans may, came to a, night, uh, a decision, and that was that they would focus more on the state legislatures. And by focusing on the state legislatures, they were able to capture the state houses. By doing that, they controlled how the districts would be set up for the 2012 reapportionment. In doing that, you saw this year um, a, a political map that was very different. The Republicans were, although President Obama won, although the Senate, they picked up two seats in the Senate, the Democrats, the Republicans were able to hold the House of Representatives. In light of the fact that Democrats received nationally in House of Representatives votes, 5,905,000 votes, something like that, 5,900,000. The Republicans received 5,400,000. So they received a half million less votes, yet they were able to hold on to, so that, that comes out to whatever the percentages are. I think it's 50.5% or 50.3% to 49.7. Um, um, but they were able to hold 53% of the seats. They were able to hold on to 234. The majority is 218. So they were able by, by reapportionment to hold on to a large part of the House of Representatives. Now, I add this parenthetically, that you're hearing discussion now from certain circles. Well, what we need to do is we need to have, we need to change around the way the Electoral College is set up to do it the way we do it in primaries, to apportion electoral votes based upon congressional districts rather than upon states. Of course they want to do that because if that had been the case in this election, we might be talking about President Romney right now as opposed to President Obama. Okay, So that is, that is sort of one of the difficulties that has happened. Now that being the case, so what we have now is um, Democratic districts that are very, very heavily Democratic, Republican districts that are slightly Republican. So. If you're, if you're a Democrat and you're in a heavy Democratic district, what is your greatest fear? Is your greatest fear a moderate Democrat? Probably not. Your greatest fear is a more liberal Democrat who's going to you know, beat you pretty good in a primary when you start talking about liberal issues in a Democratic primary. Because let's face it, the base comes out, those that are passionate. But the same thing happens in the Republican Party. So in these, these 234 Republican districts, they're more concerned about someone coming further to the right of them and beating them in a primary than they are about Democrats. So what is that, what, what, what happens then? It creates everyone moving further to the right and further to the left because they do not want to be beaten in a primary. In, in, in this, this happened, and one of the examples I think we should talk about is the Indiana election this year, the Indiana Senate election with uh, Murdoch and Donnelly. Um, and that exact thing happened to um, Dick Luger, who was the senator. Now, Dick Luger was a senator from Indiana for 35 years. Dick Luger was so popular that in 2006, when he ran as a Republican, he did not even have a Democrat opposing him in the United States Senate race in Indiana. So he gets a primary from a Tea Party, very right-wing, state treasurer by the name of Murdoch. And what do they do? They show pictures of him with President Obama. And that's their camp, that's one of their campaign ads. Now, in normal circles, in a normal time, being depicted with the president is usually a pretty good thing, regardless of what party the president is, because normally in, in sort of the political thinking, hey, that means you have access to the president, that means you're a more effective legislator. Except it didn't have that effect for Luger, and um, a huge amount, like four and a half million, just under four and a half million dollars in outside money poured into that race into Murdoch against Luger. Luger loses. So then what happens in that particular race, that was, that was a little bit of an anomaly. Um, Joe Donnelly, who was a, uh, was a classmate of mine, came in, he was a blue dog, centrist, um, pro-life, um, sort of the, the typical kind of a Democrat if you're going to survive in the state of Indiana that you need to be a conservative Democrat runs against um, he gets reapportioned out of his district they do a real job and he says well I'll run for the Senate 
And then when he sees Luger, he sees Murdoch go against Luger and Luger lose, he figures he's got a pretty good shot. But he's still down pretty good until Murdoch makes his uh, famous statement um, that um, uh, with respect to rape, and um, uh, Joe ended up winning it's still a very, what, what turned out to be a very, very close race. But that is the classic example of what happens. So you have a, in, in, here you have a guy like Dick Luger who has, who's the chair, well, he's ranking member now of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but has real clout. And he was one of the people that would make the compromises. He was one of the people that would, you know, sort of bring together both sides. Uh, and but we lost, you know, we, we lost him in the race. I mean, I'm pretty happy because uh, uh, my friend Joe Donnelly's there. But nonetheless, I, I think you get a sense of, of, of what happens here. So it's interesting because um, I think that what you're seeing more and more of is that people are not are afraid to be moderates. And you know, this whole idea of a moderate. I, I guess one of the, we talked about this a little bit this morning. One of the, my staff used to always say to me, you know, Mike, you talk about being a moderate, and I'm not sure that it's the right word. And I said, well, what other word, I mean, there isn't another word that you can use. You know, because people tend to equate being a moderate, I think, with having no values, with lacking conviction. I mean, you hear those things with respect to moderate. And I think, you know, that's why I like Gil Troy's book, um, uh, Leading from the Center, so much because it, it, it talks about being a moderate, not as being someone who lacks conviction or as someone who um, is afraid to make decisions, but rather as someone who is willing to look at all sides of it and make a decision and then have the, the ability to, to make that, um, that decision um, uh, a reality. So I think that is, um, it was interesting. Um, I want to bring this point up too uh, because we were talking this morning. There was an email um, uh, you were saying. Uh, it, as part of in response to some of the advertising for this talk, uh, I received an email saying, uh, Michael Curry uh, should know about the, what, could, what does he know about the extinction of the American moderate? He's no moderate. Right. So I thought that was great. Um, um, because I'm still getting, I've been out of office for four years and I'm still getting, um, uh, or two years, and I'm still getting told that I'm not what I say that I am. In any case, um, the point of it is, is I think that, you know, when you get, and I used to get this, I used to be experienced, my district, uh, again, I, I explained where my district ran, but part of my district was Tompkins County. Um, and I would have so much trouble when I would go into the the, the, the college communities, you know, Clinton, where Hamilton College is. Uh, I would go in Geneva, where Hobart is. I would go down to, in the city of Cortland, where Cortland is. I'd go to Tompkins County, where Cornell and um, uh, Ithaca is. I could never be liberal enough there. Um, and I would get beat up more by my base um, for not being what they wanted me to be, not being liberal enough. And then I would come back up to the northern part of the district in Herkimer County, and they would talk about me like I was a left-wing communist, you know? I mean, because I was actually had the temerity to be a Democrat and, and be the first one to represent Herkimer County since 1948. So it was really sort of a difficult balance. So you try to be you try to be a moderate not only for your district, but because I think that is one of the things that, that's, that's sorely lacking today um, in, in, our, in our government, and I think one of the problems that we have. I'd like to close with a quote um, from Giltroy's book, <coughs> Leading from the Center, and I think he has it right. Radicals, although I think for purposes of our discussion, extremists might be um, a better word to use, articulate ideas and uphold ideals, whereas leaders translate moral abstractions into more realistic, popular, and palatable policies. And I think that's so true. I mean, in, in Please don't think that, in, 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 from my lecture, that I, I have a dislike or a disdain for the polls. I think clearly the extremes are what make America, America. But for um, the abolitionists, we wouldn't have freed the slaves. But for you know, so many different um, 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 sides pulling us to the middle, we wouldn't be where we are. But I think that the necessity of a moderate is the person that can find um, um, a, a, help, uh, a, a um, feasible um, alternative and help get us there. And I think that's what we need more of. And again, when you look at the good presidents, uh, I think you, you, know, you, you don't always, you don't, they don't always appear to be moderates, 
But when you really examine how they act, you see that they truly, the greatest presidents, were the ones that led from the center. So thank you, and I'd like to open it up, if we can now, uh, for questions. Yes. Um, just going back to your the, your ideas about redistricting and causing a lot of problems for moderates and self independent institutions. Right? And then you uh, you cited uh, Murdoch as an example, which is like which is a statewide race. So right. I just wondering if you could also comment on poll because then it seems like it's less redistricting. And there, I mean redistricting is obviously a problem, but also there's a problem of polarization in the population in general. I don't know. If you could. Right. Well, I, I use the 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 Murdoch race because I think that clearly. Um, better than any, um, I, because it had a national appeal, um, it, it really, I think, clearly demonstrated what I'm talking about. When you have an, an, an area or a, a jurisdiction um, and you have a moderate in it, the moderates tends to be, the greatest problem for a moderate tends to be from his extreme, which, which happened there, which is part of the polarization. Now, for me, I was sort of the opposite. I was a moderate Democrat in a Republican district. Now, when I ran the first time, I ran against a conservative Republican, okay? My predecessor was a moderate Republican, Rockefeller Republican type. He retired, and I ran against a, someone who was pretty conservative. So it was very easy for me to stake out the middle and take everything to the left. When I lost, and I, I ran twice against the person who, um, uh, uh, Richard Hanna, who ended up, um, who, who is now the congressman. The first time I was able to hold on, the second time, he did, he was a moderate. He was a moderate Republican, and in a predominantly Republican district, the moderate, two moderates, the one with the larger party is probably going to win, which is exactly what happened. But you don't usually, what I'm saying is, what you're getting, and you saw it here in Syracuse. I mean, Dan Maffei was um, a moderate, but, but he, leaned, he leaned left, and he was beaten in 2010 by a very conservative, an Anna Marie Burkle um, representative. So he wasn't beaten by my, he was beaten by someone who was very conservative. And, and that goes to sort of what I was saying. We saw a change in 2010 where many of the moderates were beaten not by other moderates, but by people who were uh, Tea Party or very conservative. We saw that. Um, I, I guess with respect to your question, um, how do you deal with polarization? I mean, I, I think part of the reason that we have polarization is we have the internet. We have 24-hour media, and, and people have, I mean, when you're thinking that you have a position and there's no one else that has a position, you tend to keep that position to yourself. When you're on the internet and you see that there are thousands of other people that have the same position that you have, or you're watching a particular channel on the news and you see many people having the same view, I think it tends to, to strengthen or your own view and your own willingness to get involved in it. So I think that could be part of the reason, uh, you know, I, I'm... I, I haven't thought about it a lot, but, but that would be one of my thoughts as to why we have so much polarization. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just wondering, your talk, the title of the talk is The Death of the American Model, but your Indiana example, and my understanding of what's going on in politics would suggest a different title, The Death of the Republican Model. Uh, I, I wonder if you really think that the Democratic Party is dominated by the extreme left. My perception is that the Democratic Party is what a modern Republican was 10 years ago, almost every Yeah, day. I mean, I think there's a lot of truth to that, but, but it has happened, and I'll cite just two examples in Pennsylvania in the House races this year. Um, two um, moderate blue dog Democrats were beaten by two um, um, much more liberal Democrats. So it does happen, but I think to your point, I, I think there's, there's a lot to be said for that point. Um, I, I think we see it much more in the Republican Party. I mean, you look at it, and I think part of it has to do with sort of the change, the demographic change in America. I mean, the, the Northeast, think about this. They're, um, may, the entire New England, I don't think there is a single Republican in the House of Representatives in the state of New England. Um, New York is still pretty dominated by... Um, by Democrats. So I think you're seeing in the Northeast the, the old Rockefeller Republican sort of being replaced by the moderate Democrat. Um, and in the South, you're seeing the old, you know, um, um, what they call it, yellow dog Democrats replaced by conservative Republicans. So you're, you're seeing a little bit of a change. You see it, I think it's much clearer on the Republican side. But 
you don't see it as much on the Democratic side because in the House of Representatives, they know why I can tell you having been there, you see it. I mean, we were the blue dogs and we had a lot of votes, so the, the majority had to come to the blue dogs in order to get um, legislation through. But um, you do see it. You see it on both. I mean, I, I felt that I would get the veiled threats every now and again from, from the left. Hey, you know, you can get a primary. And I respected that because I knew that I might have a little trouble getting my blue collar base out, but, you know, um, a, a very liberal Democrat might not have the same problem. So, yes, ma'am. It seems there's a great deal of the sense of, of choice in beginning to rest with the um, primaries rather than with the um, final election. If that's the case, how do you, what, how does one go about energizing the public to become much more concerned about the votes in the primary than they are? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Although Tom um, Crusoe this morning made a good suggestion. I mean, I mean, maybe we. It, it's sad that we would have to do this, but but maybe we make um, um, a holiday out of election day. We give the day off, and, and this is what what Tom said to me. This is not my own idea, so I have to give him credit. But I, I, you know, you hear on the radio, and, and he's exactly right. I hear on the radio driving back and forth to work every morning that they want to make the day after the Super Bowl a holiday. Um, how about making the day after, or, or the election day a holiday like in so many other, I mean, maybe, that's what I mean, make, make election day a holiday, and, and maybe then we'll get a little more uh, enthusiasm in terms, of, in terms of our voter turnout in primary, in primary day. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Um, do you see the emergence of a third party in this country, not just the emergence of a third party, but the successful emergence of a third party, or are the Democratic or Republican Party so entrenched in this country that that's really not possible? Um, I, I, I'd like to see it. I, I think that it doesn't have to be overly successful. It doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be on the same sort of uh, level as the Republicans, but if you had a party that had 15 members, um, a third party, it could really wield some influence and in, enforce the, the two sides to move to the middle a little bit. I, I don't know that it's feasible. I think we have a, a good possible example here in New York with the, um, in the New York State Senate with the group of, um, of Democrats that um, have sort of created their own um, subgroup. It'll be interesting to see how they, how they survive and if they survive and how they affect New York state politics. Um, clearly, um, I, I think I would like to see it. I think that's that would be part of the part of the solution. I, I think it's much easier said than done. If, could I just follow the up? Sure. If if it happened on a national scale, would it be coming from the right or coming from the left? Um, you know, I, I don't know that. I mean. Um, I, my sense is that I mean, when you look at how, how they, there tends to be pretty strong um, um, unanimity, unanimity within the Republican Party. Um, Democrats tend to be the big tent and they tend to be a little more, um, you know, they used to kid, the, 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 they used to say like herding cats, trying to get the Democrats into the same place on anything. My sense is it would come from, the, if it came from any direction, it would probably come from the Democrats. That would be my sense, but that's just a guess. Yes. Good to um, see you. I had a question. In 1995, I wrote a paper saying that um, I expected the media, the news media, to do more talking head shows about the news media because talk is cheap and journalists can talk about themselves. And lo and behold, 20 years later, I've proven quite right. It seems to be the, one of the most interesting things that you said was the lack of discretionary funds for the congressional representatives come home and bring home the bacon itself leads to a shift in framing of the discussion because you can't really be a moderate on your decision when speaking about abortion. You can't be a moderate on gay rights. You can be a moderate on infrastructure. You know, you can fight over a bridge or the allocation of a dam or, you know, you can, you can do a deal on those kinds of things because it's fiscal. If it's the absence, though, of money, right, authority over the money that's the congressional problem leading to the shift in language, how can that ever be fixed unless Congress itself figures out a way to allocate more discretionary money? 
Is there anything we can do about it? No, I mean, I, I think that that is an, I, I don't think it's an intention, you know, I think it's sort of an out, outgrowth of, of what's happened. I mean, the, the practical situation is right now, we see ourselves in a, in a, in a, in a with a severe budget shortfalls. Um, no one foresees that changing for a while. But it, it, based upon that, they've done things like to save money, like cut um, discretion, cut earmarks. So if you do, if, if you're a member and I say, come on, I need you on this bill, and you say, I'm going to get beat up at home. Well, you know, what, what do you need? I mean, is, is there something else? Well, you know, um, I don't know. Well, how about if you got that bridge? You've been asking, you've been fighting for your bridge for, you know, would that maybe soften it a little bit? Mm. You know, you might say, you know, maybe that's what, maybe, you know, I, I like their bill. I know I'm going to get be beat up, but at least if I'm going to get beat up and I like the bill, at least I have something else I can show for it when people. So, you know, I mean, I, I think it's just sort of, I don't know that it'll change. I mean, unless if there's, you know, if we work our way out of this, this, this situation that wins budget situation. Right, because just to follow up, just my point was, do you think that leading the congressional representatives deliberately not talk about the economic issues as much, about like the burden of their jobs, or the things that they could do in their district, and then move to those flashpoint issues. More sure. Than like. Yes, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, how can you talk about infrastructure when you weren't able to, you know, when everyone says you need to fix the bridge over 81 right. and you didn't fix it and everyone says, you, and, you, and you campaigned on, I'm going to fix this bridge, it's been closed too long, it's, it's you know, I mean, you didn't get the money. Well, you better be talking about something else because the last thing you want is people to talk about that. And, you know, to, to your point, I think you make a great point. I was on the, I was also, not, not only on the rules, but I was on transportation. You talk about a committee where everybody gets along. I mean, I would go from rules where everybody would be jumping over their chairs to fight with each other to, to transportation where, you know, you just constantly work together because it was, you know, that was really, you got to see what it was like to do the people's work where somebody would say, all right, I'll defer, um, come and, you know, talk to me before you actually introduce your bill. And if you work the language out, then I'll support your bill. And that's somebody on the other side of the aisle, which you didn't see in a lot of places. So I think that's, that's true. Yes, ma'am. But if we don't, and I, I think a lot of people in the country did feel, they do feel, that the notion of bringing the port back to the um, constituency was not a good idea. Um, then the whole um, discourse of communication has to change. It isn't that you need to say, oh my goodness, yes, that has caused the problem. Let's go back to what was before. It's what do you put in place of those kinds of negotiations mm -hmm. Well, well, I'm not I, saying I don't that, know that I know the answer, but I think that somebody needs to start thinking through that issue. Right. And, and I'm not saying that that's the I'm saying that that, that okay. it appears to me that that's one of the problems that you have today. I mean, I don't know that I would I would advocate. I, would, I certainly if I was in, in the house would not want to advocate that as a way for us to get along better. But clearly it is. I mean, let me give you I love telling this story because, you know, you said pork. And that was your, that's your, I call them earmarks, you call them pork, it, the same, we're talking about the same thing. So this is a true story. I was at a, um, a um, 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 the North Utica Senior Day Center. And I was giving, when I was in Congress, I was giving a speech, and um, some woman who I actually knew just starts, to, you know, there, there's pork barrel spending, and she just was, she started riding me, and I'm thinking, I know that. I've known this woman my whole life. I can't believe she's beating up on me like this. So, you know, and we, we kind of ended it, and it was, a, it was a good group, and it went very well. This is a true story. I walk out, and I'm saying goodbye, shaking everybody's hands. She comes around the corner, out in the hallway, and she goes, Michael, I have to talk to you. And I say, yeah, she goes, here, here's an envelope. She said, it, it's the description of our elevator that we need here for, this, um, for, our, for our, our center. Can you see if you can get us some money for this elevator? I said, that's an earmark. That's what you, oh, that's different. That's not what I was talking about. I was talking about something else. So everybody, you know, it's really, and, and that's a true story. I kept that envelope because I love the fact that, you know, um, it happened. But it, it's so true that, you know, that is one of the things that traditionally um, um, representatives have been able to do is, is, is bring projects back to their district. And I used to argue, well, look, the reason that I do that is this money is going to be spent. If I don't spend it, then the president or someone in the administration is going to spend it. And frankly, they don't know my district as well as I do. Now, if I, if I, if I ask for the earmark and you don't, and it's, it's, it has to be transparent and my, and my vote, my constituents don't like it, then you know who to blame for it. You blame me. But 
if it's done the other way, that's still going to happen, but that money's going to come from somebody else who you're not going to be able to identify. So um, that's just my little thing on, on your marks. Yeah, Tom. Is, is there a recipe? I mean, I know that there's moderates out there that have a big program, um, some with the Christie to moderate in some respect, and he's kind of moving to the left as the election gets closer, but for congressional uh, members, is there a recipe for those who don't have that kind of national podium um, for success? For uh, I think of maybe um, Congressman Owens up in the North Country. You know, he's been able to hold on to a Republican district for a while. But what's that recipe? What, what does he do well? Um, what can other um, congressional members do in order to stake out their place in a district that kind of uh, runs away from them? Well, I mean, I mean, Bill's a perfect fit for the North Country. I mean, he's he's just, he is the North Country. He has a, a strong military background. He served a lot of years. You know, he, he first off, he's a perfect fit, sharp guy. He, you know, he, he gets it. He understands what's important to his district. But he also had the benefit for two elections of having a conservative in the race, um, drawing from the Republican that he was running against. Now, this, this past race, he ran flat out straight head to head against the Republican, and he won. Um, but he won two very close ones, you know, his first two, um, with a conservative running and a, and a Republican running. So they split the opposite, they split the vote against him, and he was able to, to, to draw his base in some of the middles. So he was able to win. So um, I mean, he, he's sort of unique, but I would say in this past election, um, you know, he, um, uh, he fits the district. Um, he is sort of the, the, the example of someone that can do it. He's got a Republican district. He's a Democrat. He's a moderate. Uh, and he does it. But, you know, they're going to target him. I mean, he will get, he will get repeated. He'll never have a day of, of, of rest because he'll always be campaigning. And he always has to raise money because, you know, they'll be spending huge, huge amounts of money. I, I don't have an answer to your question, um, but he is clearly the kind of moderate um, that I am talking about who has survived. Right? And a lot of that is personal you know, I think just personal charisma on his part, personal ability on his part. Um, yes, you first and then you. you. said it was a lot about raising money. Yes. And I'm, I'm assuming that the money that's raised is spent mostly on television. Well, I mean, I, I don't understand, like, in this day and age with the Internet, if I could run for Congress for the $50 GoDaddy website, and that's not, I'm going to lose. I mean, people just listen to the TV, that they believe the TV. Right. There's no way for anybody to win without $2 million. I can't win with $2,000 unless I'm, unless I'm a, a celebrity where people sort of already know me. Or, or you're, you're in the right district and things, you know, fall correctly for you. You're in a, if you're a Republican, you're a heavy Republican district. You manage <laughs> by some, you know, um, uh, fortune or good fortune or a talent to be picked as the candidate. And you're able to do it, and you know you, you run, or you're in a Democratic district, and you do that. But realistically speaking, and I, I used to kid Dan Maffei because Dan had a buy in the Syracuse media, and he bought a little in the Rochester, but but mostly the Syracuse. I had to buy Syracuse, I had to buy Utica, which is cheap, and Binghamton. Uh, together, Utica and Binghamton were about what Syracuse. But I would be spending more in my small in my rural district than Dan would spend here in the Syracuse. I mean, than the Albany media market, very expensive. You know, so they would spend huge. So it really, and then, you know, you get the very big markets they don't spend. In New York City, obviously, they can't. But um, a lot depends on the media market that you're in and how much that you have to spend. You know, some of the small rural markets just buy radio. Um, but in, you know, any, any major media, I mean, it, that's what it's about. I, you, know, you know, there's no other way around it. Yes, sir. I'm wondering about the role of the party in terms of orthodoxy. I, years ago, Oh, did you? Yes. And one time it was actually after a raid election, a lot of Moment they left Williamsburg, they became nuts. <laughs> and, and 
and you know, it's just the youngest doing that, you know, they are late kids. I have a sense that they, that even though I disagree with them on some policy issues, that I respect that the, the apparent motivation they had to run to Washington. They really wanted to make things better. They wanted to learn about how you know, things work. But then they left and they had to sort of toe the party line. They mm -hmm. didn't actually say what seemed like kind of reasonable things that they were saying was behind the closed doors and the Senate. Right. And, and I think the same thing happened with the Democrats, too. Is that, that, and, and you probably ran into this as a new doctor. You probably often wear doctors for leadership and they would punish you. Yeah, it, I mean. It, it is there. There's always that concern of of being punished. I mean, you know, when I I voted no on health care, and you know, you, you have to know how to do it. You have to tell them you can't play games. I mean, so I, I as early as I could make the decision, I said no, I'm a no, and that's it. And um, you know, you you kind of get the you get the cold shoulder from a lot of people. You really do. You get. You know, some people. You know, once once you've you've established it, then it starts to cold shoulder, and it takes a while. Um, we were because the majority was relatively new for us. The orthodoxy it, it was they didn't instill the orthodoxy quite the way they they I, I would imagine Sam Rayburn did when he had years and years of it, um, because we were still new and they were still a little unsure on how much they could push some of the moderates. So you didn't see it quite as much, but I, I can remember walking in. I wasn't even sworn in yet, and a fight. They had a fight for the majority leader between Jack Murtha and Steny Hoyer, and I was with <coughs> Steny, and a lot of the leadership was not. And boy, it was you know I, I can remember that was my fr from from someone else saying, well you know, it, it's not going to be very good for you if you start this early on doing that. And, you know, I mean, I had been a DA for a lot of years, so I kind of was, was used to, you know, uh, things like that. So, I said, yeah, well, you know, I'm, we'll, we'll see what happens. And, and nothing happened. Um, but, you know, it, it, you really, um, I think the longer you go, the stronger the orthodoxy can become by the party. I mean, Republicans seem to be much better at it than Democrats are. I have to say that. I mean, I'm, I'm not a Republican, but judging, watching, I mean, when, when they vote no, they all vote no. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, or they all vote yes on something. You know, the Democrats, everybody's all over. I mean, it's the big tent, you know. So, um, but uh, they try. Uh, they try, and uh, that, that's a very interesting uh, thought because everybody does get along very well at Williamsburg, and that lasts a very short time. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. Great. Yes. Good to, Good to see you. Um, window dressing, book cover on a message and, um, and, and hope to uh, attract to your party people who have substantive, your substantive votes, which is that you have a disdain for. So um, I'm just curious uh, what you think um, about that, whether that will be successful, the sincerity of that, the wisdom of that in a country that obviously is drastically different uh, I think there is there is a there can be a degree of success in rebranding um, an idea a party. I mean, depending. I mean, I think it takes a little while. I have kind of a strange theory on how people vote, um, and my theory is this: you walk up to somebody, they look at you, and they either viscerally like you or they don't like you, and they can't help it. Then it's up to you as the person who's seeking office to affirm that they like you, all right? Because generally most people, I mean, the majority of people will like the majority of people. If you're nice to them, they will like you. Then it's up to you to prove to them that you are the person they think you are, okay? So I think there is sort of this visceral feeling in people is if they like the message, and I'm sure the message will be good, whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it'll be good. If they like it, they'll want to like, you know, they'll, they'll want to support it, but then they'll have that little window of, do they believe it? Okay? And so I think it can be successful depending on the message, but it's not just the message. It's what are you doing to follow it up? So if you're there saying, we are going to be the party of, you know, the inclusive party of the Big Tent, 
It's not just the Democrats anymore. But then they're doing other things that, you know, um, um, it may not be successful. So that's sort of my sense. Um, I think people decide immediately they meet you. I'm going to vote for him. I'm going to vote for him. Then he opens his mouth. And if what he says is good, then it reaffirms it. And I say, I'm going to support this guy. I may even give money to his campaign. If he opens his mouth on the other hand and says something that's really, you know, um, uh, uh, disheartening to me, then I'll reevaluate it. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's sort of my sense of it. Out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.